Welcome to the Church of Christ at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, where whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome. And welcome to this union service. We are so thrilled to be together and to have you join us in worship. I'm the Reverend Mandy Lake Freeberg, the senior pastor of the Church of Christ here in Hanover. I'm Kim McCurley, minister at Bethany Church, United Church of Christ in Randolph, Vermont. It is good to be together with our colleagues and with all of you as we usher in this spring day with one another. And I'm the Reverend Amanda Swoyer from the North Pomfret Church. And it's a delight to be with all of you again and with my colleagues. I look forward to this blessed service with you. And as we have done throughout the pandemic, we are practicing safe protocols, wearing masks as we're inside. And we know during this time when the directions and guidance is changing and when our vaccination rates are higher than they have been, we have lots of decisions to make. We will continue to practice safe protocols so that we make it to the end of this pandemic with all of us present and together. Thank you for being a part of this remote service as we work to keep each other safe and to enter into God's new chapter for us. Join me, please, in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of the melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the Lord. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy. Let all creation praise our God. Now I invite you to pray with me the prayer of the day. Let us pray together. With the psalmist, we sing, O God of all creation. We sing because words alone are not enough. 
We need a soaring song to sing your praise, lilting voices to name our gratitude for your guidance and your grace. We are thankful beyond measure that your merciful kindness is our constant companion, that your faithfulness endures forever. Blessed are we, Holy One, to be named your beloved. We pray in the name of Jesus, the one who calls us friends. Amen. Come now, mighty God, help us your name to long. Our songs we raise, ruler of glorious, for all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Now is the time for the prayer of confession, where we spend some time praying together and then some time in silent reflection where we think about the things that we may have done that we shouldn't have done, or the things we haven't done that we should have done. Let us join together in the prayer of confession. God of mystery, three in one, Throughout history, you have been made known to us, and yet we each strive to know you for ourselves. Forgive us when we make you too small or project you in our own image rather than understanding that you created us in your image, the image of one capable of loving all creation from plants and crawling creatures to each of your beloved children, even when we disappoint you. Forgive us when we fight, as siblings often do. Guide us in your ways of wisdom, that we may love you, your creation, and one another more deeply day by day. In the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, we pray. Amen. Even though God is beyond what we can comprehend, God knows each one of us. God knows you and loves you so much that nothing can ever separate you from God's love. You are important, wanted, needed, loved, and forgiven. Let us celebrate. God's forgiving love and grace as we sing the Gloria Patri. Glory to the Creator and Christ the Holy Spirit in one as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall
This is God Sunday. Sometimes we call it Trinity Sunday, which is kind of complicated. And we try to explain God, because there's God, and there's Jesus, and there's the Holy Spirit. They're all three, but they're really one. It's too complicated. What we really need to know is that God loves you. And God wants you to love one another. Our scripture reading today tells us that Jesus asked us to love one another as he loved them and his disciples. And he wants us to be friends with each other and treat each other like friends. So I have a couple of stories for you about friends. And I want you to think what does a friend mean? What is a friend to you? That's a big word, although we don't think of it all. One story is about a little girl who didn't have very much. She didn't even have very clean clothes. Her parents didn't know much about how to take care of children. Her life was pretty sad, and she was new in a school and the kids started picking on her about all the things that were different about her. And one little girl stepped up and she knew those kids in the class, but she didn't know the new little girl who was feeling really sad and scared and alone. And she told each one of those kids something that she remembered about them. Bobby, do you remember the day you wore the pink shirt and everybody picked on you? Do you remember how that felt? Joe, do you remember the day you brought a new backpack and somebody made fun of it? Jane, do you remember the day you got your hair cut and people picked on you because they said you looked like a boy and it really hurt your feelings? Leave her alone. You're hurting her feelings. You know what that feels like. She was a friend to that little girl whom she barely knew, but she was also a friend to all of the other kids who were being mean. She wasn't mean back to them. She helped them understand what it meant to be a friend. And another story is about two girls who were refugees. That means their families had no place to live. Where they used to live was too dangerous and they had to leave. And so a bunch of people were walking a long distance. And one little girl didn't have any shoes. And another girl came up to her and started talking, and they got to be friends with one another. And when the little girl with those shoes' feet started hurting, the other girl took off her sandals and let her wear them for a while. And all through the journey, they would swap the shoes back and forth when each other's feet got tired and sore. And sometimes they each wore one shoe because that was kind of funny and it made it even more fun sharing. And when they got to their destination and they found places to live and one family moved far away from the other family, the little girls each took a sandal so they could remember that friendship that they had. So those are a couple of stories about what it means to be friends. What would you do for a friend? For someone maybe you didn't even know, could you act like a friend to them if you barely knew them? Would you share with someone even if it was something you needed? Those are some things that God would want us to do as friends. And those are things that Jesus taught us about how to be friends with one another. He was a great example, and we have lots of stories in the Bible about God and who God is and what we're supposed to learn about how to behave because of this God that is so complicated and mysterious. Will you pray with me? Holy One, God, Creator, Jesus, Holy Spirit, help us to be good friends to one another, to love others 
as we know you love us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from John 15, verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. A few weeks ago, I was privileged to be invited to share a session with this year's confirmation class. They are a varied, thoughtful, lovely bunch of young people working together to figure out life and theology. As a part of our time together, Rob introduced the question typically asked of confirmands if they decide to join the church. The point was to begin this discussion and familiarity with these ideas earlier so that they can think about them and live with them as they prepare to decide whether to formally become members or not. These questions come from the Book of Worship of the United Church of Christ. As we looked at them, Rob and I took turns fleshing out their meaning. The first question that Rob addressed was, do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? There are other ways to say that if some of the confirmants have not been baptized, and every year we've been thrilled to be able to have some confirmation baptisms. The second question is, do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? When Rob asked me to open up that second question, I found myself going to a strange place, strange in terms of wanting to draw 13 and 14-year-olds into the wonder and beauty of the faith of the Christian church. After talking about how we are all able to support one another to overcome the complications and injustices of common life to resist evil together, I began to speak about how one of the freedoms of new life in Christ means that we don't need to be afraid of death, that knowing that God is with us in this life and the next, that God's power and presence can overcome death and fear, our faith can give us strength and direction to do even really hard and dangerous things. This is the freedom of new life in Christ that I felt. Now, it's not really generally a selling point in terms of membership. Hey, this church thing is so powerful and so compelling that you might be willing to risk it all in love for the community and the humanity that God has drawn you to be a part of. This conversation made me think about the way in which our faith impacts our life and particularly as we think about our deaths and how that impacts our faith. And it reminded me of a friend from years ago, someone who was completely preoccupied with my work as a minister, and especially as my function as someone who oversaw memorial services. She was a teacher who worked with my husband at a small, independent, struggling school. And I had gotten to know this person better after following my leading of a huge memorial service for a colleague of both she and my husband. In the dead of winter, Laura, a fellow teacher, had died after a long journey with cancer. The air was cold, and our hearts were frozen. Laura was beloved, a mother of three teenagers and a dear person. 
And as I stood at that pulpit with over 300 people, lots of them parents my own age with kids my child's age, I ached for what to say. For the next few years, the woman who was so curious about my work would introduce me as, you know, this is Mandy. She led Laura's, her, 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 her funeral. You know, she did Laura's thing. Whenever I saw her, she would ask lots of questions about my work. What will you do today, she would often say, with such excitement in her voice and a little bit of bemusement. When I think about my job, she said to me once, my work seems simple compared to yours. There was clearly something going on behind all of her curiosity. I didn't know about her religious life, whether she had a practice or not, but she was completely preoccupied about what my life was like as someone who worked as a minister. Finally, one day, I think she opened up the heart of her question, the root of her focus. We were having a conversation with several different teachers at the school, and she asked with great earnestness, what do you do, you know, at a funeral when someone was um, a crab? What do you do when you can't find anything nice to say about them? You know, do you just make things up about them, or... How do you handle that? I shared with her that I try to be as honest as possible about the person, to talk about them truthfully and to find the integrity and the meaning in their life, even if it wasn't that they were polite or nice or kind. I said that it seemed important to me to be honest because when the service was over, if I had created a fiction that was much more impressive than the real person, all of those who knew and loved them would have felt that they hadn't been honored or represented. The other teachers in the conversation chimed in that honesty seemed the most important thing, which is what brought me, I think, to the heart of my acquaintances' constant wonderings and preoccupation. How is it that we make sense out of a life, out of what it means to live with intention and wholeness, How do we perceive our own lives, our own sense of meaning and purpose, and the lives of others? What is our purpose? I think that what this woman teacher friend was really asking is, what ought our days to be full of? And what makes for a satisfying, lasting impression when our days are ended? How will we be remembered? Will we have done anything that really mattered, anything that made a difference? that was worth all of the work and the worry and the joy and the grace. This coming Monday is Memorial Day, a holiday which has been understood differently over its long history. For many of us, Memorial Day simply marks the beginning of summer, a three-day weekend, thanks be to God, and maybe a time for a barbecue or friends coming over. But this is not what Memorial Day was instituted for, and it's not its intended purpose. Memorial Day was originally known as Decoration Day because it was a time set aside to honor the nation's Civil War dead by decorating their graves. It was first widely observed on May 30th, 1868, as a day to commemorate the sacrifices of Civil War soldiers by proclamation of General John A. Logan, of the Grand Army of the Republic, an organization of former soldiers and sailors. On May 5th, 1868, Logan declared in General Order 11 that, quote, the 30th of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet church in the whole land. There is no observance, no form of ceremony prescribed, but posts and comrades will, in their own way, arrange such bidding services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. General Logan was certainly right. The dead were everywhere. The Civil War affected every city, town, state, family, everyone. 
Over half a million Americans died on our soil during the Civil War. Civil War. 529,375 to be exact. When we think about so much loss, we wonder and are preoccupied about the meaning of the lives that ended, about their impact, their power, their purpose, what they will leave as a legacy. I think that's what my friend's question was about, really, every time she talked about what it was like to be a minister. She wanted to know how I helped people make sense of life and how I helped families and loved ones make sense of death. So that's a part of what we do with faith. What do we do with the gift of existence? How do we make it matter that we live and that we will one day die? As the wife of a history teacher, I've seen more than my share of movies about the Civil War. One scene, however, always stays with me. In the movie Gettysburg, there is a scene where General Joshua Chamberlain a young officer from my home state of Maine is given custody of 124 soldiers who have declared mutiny. They thought they had signed up for a two-year stint, but when most of their fellow soldiers were dismissed, they were told that they needed to stay on for another third and final year of service. They had fought 11 battles. They were weary. They felt that leadership was lacking, and they wondered if they were accomplishing anything, if what was being asked to give of themselves was more than the task at hand warranted. As they went entered Joshua Chamberlain's camp, he had just been told that his whole regiment was needed down the road. So he needed to convince these men to come with him. He was a gentle man. He had been in the army for less than a year, before that, he was a professor at Bowdoin College teaching ethics and rhetoric. And he gathers these men together, and he shares with them why what lies ahead of them, though dangerous and overwhelming, is important. Please listen as Rob shares his words with us. We're moving out in a few minutes. We'll be moving all day. I've been ordered to take you with me I'm told that if you don't come with me, I can shoot you. Well, you know I won't do that. Maybe somebody else will, but I won't. So that's that. Here's the situation. The whole Reb army is up that road, always waiting for us. So this is no time for an argument like this. I tell you, we could use you fellows. We're now well below half strength. Whether you fight or not, well, that's, that's up to you. Whether you come along is, well, you're coming. You know who we are and what we're doing here. But if you're going to fight alongside us, there are a few things I would like you to know. This regiment was formed last summer in Maine. There were a 1,000 of us then. There are less than 300 now. All of us volunteered to fight for the Union, just as you did. Some came mainly because we were bored at home. Maybe this looked like it might be fun. Some came because we were ashamed not to. Many of us came because it was the right thing to do. All of us have seen men die. This is a different kind of army. If you look back through history, you will see men fighting for pay, for women, for all kinds of loot. They fight for land, for power, because a king leads them, or just because they like killing. But we're here for something new. This has not happened much in the history of the world. We are an army out to set other men free. America should be free ground, all of it not divided by a line between slave and free states, all the way from here to the Pacific Ocean. No man has to bow. No man born to royalty. Here, we judge you by what you do, not by who your father was. Here, you can be something. 
Here, you can make a home. But it's not the land. There's always more land. It's the idea that we all have value, you and me. What we're fighting for, in the end, we're fighting for each other. Sorry, I didn't mean to preach. You, you, you go ahead. You talk for a while. And if, if you choose to join us, you want your musket, muskets back, you can have them. Nothing more will be said by anybody, anywhere. If you choose not to join us, well, you can come along under guard, and when this is all over, I will do what I can to see you get a fair treatment. But for now, we're moving out. Gentlemen, I think if we lose this fight, we lose the war. So if you choose to join me, I'd be personally very grateful. Of the 124 men who had been mutinying, 118 ended up fighting with Chamberlain. And by the end of the second day, three more had joined them. They rose up and helped out because they wanted their lives to be lived for something more lasting than simply their own life span. They wanted to achieve something in our nation that might make a difference for generations to come. Now clearly, we as a nation have not fully lived out the aspiration of liberty and justice for all. And the last year or so, we have been made painfully aware of that, and it's high time. We've not achieved equality for all or empowerment for all, or opportunity for all. We have not shared resources fairly or well. We have had a pandemic of COVID-19, and a pandemic of racism, and a pandemic of greed. And we are living into what that all means. Living in the midst of these pandemics, in the midst of massive dying, such as the Civil War, which made those men think about how their lives ought to unfold, such as when one dear friend dies far too young with so much left to accomplish, or when people have died in our nation from COVID-19, even more, 60,000 more at this count than died in the Civil War. When life is brutish and violent for so many young people, it causes us to say, what is the point? What matters most? Why? Has this gift been given us? And how can we open it up to be full of what God calls us to? How shall we live? And what will we do to make a difference? Beloved, these are the questions we ought to ask ourselves every day. These are the questions that ought both to challenge us and empower us, to give us a sense of meaning and purpose. Amanda talked about being a friend, that that's what God calls us to do. And being a friend is both those we know and love intimately, but it is being a friend in the scriptural sense of being a neighbor, to love those we know next door and those who live across the globe. Our faith calls us to invest the gift of life with meaning and purpose and selflessness, to work to set others free, even as we do the same. The second question the confirmands are asked is, do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? That's the question each of us ought to live into every day. As we remember people who have sacrificed their life in battle, may we be people who sacrifice our lives in hope that the world may be more whole and holy, more just and equitable, more abundant and grace-filled, and that we may all be blessed. Amen and amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, we gather in the splendor of springtime when you dazzle us with your creation, with apple blossoms and lilacs, with pansies and petunias and peonies. Sparkling sunshine, kneaded and nourishing rains, even a full flower moon to light up the night sky. Your extravagant beauty greets us at every turn, and oh, how it fills our hearts. We are grateful. We gather in this springtime that really does feel like spring, as we begin to emerge from a long, hard season of illness and isolation. We give thanks that around us the pandemic is waning and that we are taking first steps into the promise of a new day. We pray for so many who continue to feel the impact of the year just past with lingering health concerns, lost learning, economic struggles, emotional distress. Keep us patient with each other as we make our way into this new season. We gather on this Memorial Day weekend, remembering those who through the generations have given themselves in service and in sacrifice to this nation. May we honor their memory, and may we pledge to work for true peace and justice in every corner of the world. Hear our prayer, holy God, for us. As we strive to be friends of Jesus, those who will share our bread with the hungry and our homes with those in need of shelter, who will offer our care to the sick, our love to those who feel unwanted, unneeded, invisible, alone. Help us, God, to be the friends of Jesus by standing in solidarity with those whose lives are diminished, even threatened, because they are deemed to be other. Let us remember that in your love there is no other. The hymn writer reminds us of the privilege that is ours to carry everything to you in prayer. So, holy God, let us take advantage of that privilege and in the silence of this moment, offer to you our individual petitions. And now, dear God, we join our hearts and voices as one to offer the prayer that Jesus taught his friends when they asked him how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the time when we would invite you to bring your offerings forward to share of your treasure. And we know that you've been sharing of your time and your talent and your treasure in these times. Each one of you knows how to send in your offering, and we invite you to do that now. 
And in my church, we often ask for God sightings as an offering to each other. So think about wonderful things that have been offered to you that lift your spirits and fill your hearts. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise all of all the heavenly host. Great eternal Christ and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer of dedication together. Please join me. Holy One, even in your greatness, you are humble enough to trust us to be your hands and feet in this world. Bless our gifts of time, talent, and treasure that we may make this world a better place together. Amen. One of the ways that we support one another to work together to resist evil and injustice and to give and live into the hope of Jesus Christ is by affirming the promises to be a community. Will you join me in our covenant? And if this is not your home church, will you also join in these words knowing that God will make them relevant wherever you worship, wherever you live, whoever you are? Loving God, you call us and we do covenant with you and with one another to walk together in all your ways as you reveal yourself to us, to give ourselves freely with open hearts to the ministry of our church, to become more faithful to the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, to celebrate your gifts of unity and diversity, to restore and protect all of your creation, to take up your mission around the world, striving for justice and peace, to care for all people, reconciling ourselves to them in love. We give thanks for your gift of grace in every human life. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. It's in a sign of dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love, thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Breathe thy loving spirit into Beloved, your life has meaning. Each life has purpose.
And in the variety is how God does God's work in the world. Your life may not look or unfold like anyone else's, and that's the point. Know that you, you have been called for such a time of this, and that you have gifts to give, life to live, joy to experience, work to do, hope to live into, and peace to inhabit. Bless you now and always. Na chidarem na mano, na midirai disi. Edi non e lontano, partiam del mio da. Yeah, yeah, yeah.